was invited to, came totally out of the blue, and I was invited to this Jewish Ndebele wedding in rural Zimbabwe. So of course I had to go. I met Dion on the first day of the wedding party, and I think within an hour or two, we were already making plans to do some sort of documentary together. Our prior documentary was more about the role of radical theater in South Africa under apartheid. And out of the public response that that film generated in South Africa, and also to some extent internationally, we came up with the idea to pursue this film. At the time, I was also working for five years with a documentary festival in Prague, Czech Republic, of music documentaries about all genres of music, not just rock music. But I saw from the things that we were presenting to the European public um, over those couple of years, the one thing that always worked with all audiences were overviews of punk music as a subculture, as a genre. And when we realized that the, the South African or Southern African punk rock story hadn't been told, it was just a natural thing to pursue. It grew directly out of everything else that, that we were already doing. And in fact, Dion had a personal background in the South African punk scene in the 80s, and so had a wealth of personal information and contacts uh, to, to the history of it to begin with. So it just, it was a very organic thing for us to pursue. How much is this era remembered in South Africa today, uh, either in terms of the music or for its role in the struggle against apartheid? Well, I mean, the, the situation in South Africa in terms of historical memory is fairly complicated. And I think in, uh, after 1994, there was a very strong and understandable desire to get away from all the horrors of the past. And so people consciously moved away from uh, remembering in particular the, the later 80s and, and early 90s, which was a really bad period for the country, and chose to celebrate uh, a more positive era. In the last five years, I think there is a, a shift in South Africa back towards acknowledging the complexity of all the things that made up the anti-apartheid struggle in the 1980s, and I think that this film plays a small role in that. It's, it's part of a, a broader movement in terms of the publication of books, uh, the role of journalists. There's a lot of re-evaluation of that period, and also of the, the role that music and non-traditional sources of political activism play. So yes, there, there's, there's more and more awareness of that that's growing as the thing comes more historically into focus. One of the things I admired very much about your film when I saw it was your treatment of the race issue with regards to punk. Uh, at least in my memory, in my experience in the US, punk was a pretty exclusively white movement with very little kind of, I think, real uh, participation of Afro-Americans or really other minorities. But I thought you handled that well, the sort of gradual uh, denouement or, or, or rapprochement, one could say, of, the, of Africans into the punk scene. Well, I think that uh, in relation to, to the point you raised, you're, you're absolutely right. I think in, in, in a lot of respects, punk is viewed as, as, as one of the whitest of the white uh, genres within rock music. I think rock music at, at its root is very African and, and, and draws on a very African rooted experience to begin with. And I think that, that punk in some ways, even in its early stages internationally, understood that and drew on that, but in, in a primeval way, not, not in an intellectual way, that those things were not articulated. And so it wasn't in its original circumstances in New York or elsewhere, uh, particularly racially inclusive music. Not that it was exclusive either. I, I just think that those, those lines were not traced. And in South Africa, over time, because punk was something that existed at the margins and was defiantly anti-government, it automatically occupied the same spaces as other multiracial, multicultural forms of resistance. And it automatically made bedfellows. It, it was just a natural outgrowth of, of what the situation already was. 
And in fact, what I found in doing research for this film, which hadn't really been, the subject had not been researched properly before we started on this, was that punk in fact was after jazz, the second form of music that did actually create a, a multiracial audience within South Africa. The fact that it did so then had a certain impact on how the, the punk culture developed in the neighboring countries, Mozambique and Zimbabwe, and so we traced that in the film. And the way in which that happened uh, is, is part of the story. It's part of the, the magic of how the thing developed, and I'm very happy that, uh, that you recognize that. It was important for us as filmmakers to get that across. We didn't want to overstate uh, a, a racial case, but we, but we didn't want to be totally aloof to the sensitivities of racial issues in terms of what we were dealing with, which is, which is a racially polarized society in which people stepped outside of that framework and said, no, there's another way to think about this. How much of the music available in South Africa now? Can you find CDs and other collections of music from this era, or is it really, as it seems in the movie, the the province of real collectors? Well, when we started doing the film, it was the province of real collectors. And that was also something I wanted to show. I personally like vinyl. I like vinyl collectors. I like that whole culture. I have a lot of respect for those guys. I, I consider them historians and archivists. So I wanted to have a certain element of that in the film. And I'm happy that it's there. Also, I'm very happy that since we made the film, um, a couple of the bands from, from the old days have managed to get their CDs reissued and in some cases in, in a much higher quality and, and better situation than, than they did originally. This was a very underground music that was very non-mainstream, in some cases illegal and banned. The fact that bands like Wild Youth and National Wake now have their CD out in South Africa and hopefully also soon internationally is, is, a, is a great reward for making the film. There's also uh, Warwick Sony from Kalahari Surfers, who you saw in the film, has started his own sort of internet record label called Shambok Music, which also releases a lot of the post-punk 1980s stuff. His own stuff from Kalahari Surfers, but also the Genuines who you saw in the film, the Dynamics, a lot of these kind of uh, early reggae bands that, that came out of the, the remains of National Wake, that stuff has all been made available for downloads, also directly as a result of the release of the film. So yeah, the situation is a lot healthier than it was a year ago in terms of being able to find and, and appreciate this music. Great. Let me get some questions from our audience. Absolutely. Yes, right here. Right. Two, two questions. Um, do we have to wait for the mic? Oh, is there a mic? No, I think we're doing it without We're doing it without? Okay. Um, I'll repeat it. Oh, okay. Um, can you talk about, in those days, how, besides obviously bands playing live in their cities, was there a touring circuit and a distribution circuit of any kind? Uh, aside from bands playing in their own cities back in the 80s, was there kind of an internal touring circuit for these bands? Would they move around South Africa, or would Durban bands play, pretty much stay in Durban? Johannesburg bands in Johannesburg? Well, I mean, that's a very uh, particular question that I've been waiting for months of screening this film for someone to ask because <laughs> I personally grew up in a very similar scene as that in the United States in the 1980s where bands would travel around and the fact that the different cities would interact created a whole network of alternative culture. In South Africa, there was an attempt already in 1979 to get something like that together, but it fell apart. The first tour that was attempted, which was called the Riot Rock Tour in 1979, which took place over the Christmas holidays, which in South Africa is also the summer holidays, so it's really a party season, and it was a great idea, but it fell apart because uh, when they got to the Western Cape, to Cape Town, none of the venues would host National Wake because they were a multiracial band. And as uh, the idea of a riot rock tour hit against a, a brick wall when, when people were concerned that there would be actual riots, that this wasn't just play acting, but it was revolutionary activity. So the, the thing dissipated. After that, there was 
the attempts to do nationwide tours on that scale never happened again. Through something called the United Democratic Front, the UDF, which was in fact an extension of the African National Congress in the 1980s that was legally able to work within South Africa. A lot of benefit concerts were set up in different cities where bands would come from Johannesburg down to Cape Town or down to Durban and would play as part of the benefits, but it didn't really constitute a proper touring network. With the result that by the end of the 80s, everything was centered in Johannesburg because that was really the only place you could consistently make a living uh, doing such marginal music. So a, a touring circuit, as asked about in the question, really didn't develop until the late 90s. And it only developed as a result of the, the growth of the internet in South Africa and the fact that people were able to independently communicate with each other outside of conventional music industry sort of structures. And then the idea of going across the country staying with the fellow bands, sleeping on their couch, and becoming part of their social network, inviting them down to Durban or wherever to do the same. That really took place, you know, 10 to 15 years after it did in the United States on a similar scale. But it did happen. In, in the 80s, it just, um, the attempts never really developed in full. Okay, we do have a mic now, so let's wait for the mic. This gentleman right here. Thank you for uh, showing us these secrets because this is nothing that we've seen before, uh, nothing I've seen before um, about how white kids uh, reacted in the late 70s and early and, and throughout the 80s in the punk world. But I'd like you to, two questions. One is to position Rodriguez and the documentary that, that has been pretty widely accepted as telling a story sure. about South Africa. And, and two, we know of many literary people, writers, and uh, who were silenced, and uh, the government took very strong action against them. Did any of that happen to any of these bands? Because that, I, if it's in the film, I didn't catch it. I just wanted to know what was the response of the apartheid regime to this mixing it up by the punk bands? Okay, firstly, uh, to address Rodriguez in this context. Rodriguez in South Africa is, as you know by now, and I'm very happy that the rest of the world uh, finally also learns about this story. Rodriguez was a very particular and unusual case. And it was also part of the way that Western records were issued <laughs> in South Africa and also Mozambique at that time. Because the SABC, in the 70s and 80s just would not play rock music in general. They would, they would play the, the cover bands from South Africa and, and diluted versions of it. But as, as extraordinary as it seems, and, and Dion's voiceover says this in the film, that the Rolling Stones were banned from radio, Bob Dylan was banned from radio. I guess it's more obvious that Bob Marley would be banned from radio. But of course people knew about all these things because Western record companies were issuing their records even on local pressings. So you couldn't hear it so easily, and it was even a bit marginalized in terms of how you could buy it, but you could find it. It was out there. You could buy a record by the Stooges. You could buy a record by the MC5. It, it wasn't totally forbidden. It wasn't like in, in communist Europe, but it was, it was marginal. It was different. <laughs> And so Rodriguez, there, in South Africa, people had no idea that this guy was not some kind of major rock star in the United States. He was actually this really obscure character from Detroit who made this two records uh, with Motown session guys of his own psychedelic folk kind of style that didn't fit into any musical trend in the United States at that time. He was an absolutely unique individual pursuing his own line in a crazy time. In South Africa, that stuff was taken at the same level like Bob Dylan or the Rolling Stones. So Rodriguez was treated in South Africa in the same way that someone like Frank Zappa or Lou Reed were treated here in the Czech Republic. He, had, he took on a hugely exaggerated status as, as this enormous figure. And people would pour over his lyrics. And, and it was a standard trope of any party of vaguely alternative people in 1970s South Africa 
regardless of race, that you would come across a Rodriguez record. But it was in that particularly, you know, in the, in the wee small hours was when Rodriguez would surface. It was, it was part of the haze of, of that era. But it's deeply imprinted into everyone's subconscious. And it is actually people past Rodriguez in South Africa onto their children. So Dion's sons also got into Rodriguez when they were 16. It's like a rite of passage there. Bizarrely, this didn't happen for Rodriguez anywhere else in the world. So it's, it's, it became part of South Africa's musical heritage. But Rodriguez is a, he's a ubiquitous but, but very unique presence. So I wouldn't say that he had any direct influence on the stuff you see in our film, but of course, everyone you see in the film, regardless of their generation, would be aware of Rodriguez in the background. He's just one of these figures who, uh, who took on an enormous importance uh, that he himself wasn't even aware of. In terms of your second question, with uh, regards to the, the exact situation of the... Sorry, I've lost my train of thought. What was the second question again? The, qu the, the question was, the, we're, we're aware... The of the... Uh, I just got the mic back. Uh, we were in censorship of bands, yes. The, the, I mean, all of this stuff was, was basically censored and, uh, and existed in a quasi-legal context. It was not uh, ever part of the mainstream in, in, until the late 90s, really. The, in terms of actual concrete stories of, of bands being treated with the same censorship as, as the literary figures that you mentioned, I mean, National Wake were, were essentially hounded out of existence. They, they lost their house, which was the crucial element to keeping their act together, because what they were doing was, was completely illegal. Warwick Sony from Kalahari Surfers had to flee the country and, and move to the UK for a certain time. The, the Durban hardcore bands in the 80s really were under enormous police pressure. And that police pressure was, was very similar to stuff that people experienced here in communist Europe in the 1980s where apart from overtly going on trial and, and being put uh, into a criminal context, there was a lot of petty harassment of just police kind of letting you know that they knew who you were and knew what you were up to just to put you off balance and, and to keep you in your place and, and to make you aware that the state was keeping an eye on these activities. There was a lot of that. And the psychological pressure of that uh, especially when you're put at the center of something like being the front person of a band or trying to organize gigs, it's, it's accelerated, it's amplified. And it's even more difficult when, when you're the, the focal point of a scene. So someone like Ruben Rose, who you see in the film, in Durban, talking about the band Power Age, who he was the drummer of, which was a very militant anti-apartheid band, he never went to jail. But he was constantly under, the, under this small-time, petty harassment from the police, which in the end encouraged him to just get out of music and take a job in the railways and do something that he knew he could support his family with and still maintain his ideals, but without putting everything into jeopardy. And there was a lot of that. I think that there was also the police would, would tear gas gigs. They, they would... Which, which is spoken about in the film, and the Kalahari Surfer song, Tear Gas, is about that. The police did uh, arrest people, especially uh, moving between racially categorized neighborhoods. In Mozambique, the, the, the punk scene was very hamstrung by the conditions of the Civil War, which is also mentioned in the film. And now today in Zimbabwe, you have other sets of conditions in which the government makes it difficult for alternative culture to happen. You, and that's 